you have to be so everywhere, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? And then eventually you want to pull back. And like, we started the conversation about how the line out the door at my show and people line to get everything. You eventually have to pull back and make yourself harder to get because mm -hmm. that, that drives people crazy. It's a different strategy though. Totally. But when you're in demand. But in the beginning, you got to just like get out there. Like I was putting up stickers everywhere all the time. What's going on, guys? We got another episode of Chats with Max. We got international artist Matt Gondick in, also Gondick Draw. Hey, what's up? How are you? <laughs> and we got the amazing Kim Rose as well. What's up? And Matt, I really wanted to have you in because, first of all, you're famous for this whole deconstructive pop art thing that you're doing. And you make paintings and sculptures of some of my favorite characters characters including the cast of Disney, some anime characters as well. We got SpongeBob, Goku, and so many more. And I wanted to talk about how you inspired me to interview you from actually Kim going out to your art show and it was themed by the theme of control, right? Yeah. It's called Recently. Control. Yeah. So Kim, why don't you talk about how that whole experience was? Yeah. So I'm gonna preface uh, that because I think it was a really wonderful experience. So my friend who's an artist actually said, We like going to different art shows together and he said, Well, my friend's having a show, we should go check it out. It's right down the street. Which is funny because I keep driving by it and I'd been seeing I think the construction of it. Mm -hmm. So I was really excited when I found out where it was and that it was your show. And so we went in, I'm painting a picture. The line was out the door like the line just to get in people were backed up i'm not even sure if you got to see because you were inside it was just wrapped all around yeah and of people just trying to get in and then on top of that so that was to get into the upstairs you go downstairs there were people lined up as well just all around to buy your stuff yeah so first i want to say congratulations Thank just you. on really all the success i can only imagine because that was insane it was packed two floors packed people packed to get in people packed to buy stuff which because it's one thing to get people to an event but i think to build up a hype enough to get people to be excited to buy yeah. and then to line up to buy that's when i told him, i was like we gotta have this guy on because he's that's doing funny. something right which i think is i mean obviously your art is beautiful but it takes a lot more than just having beautiful art yeah so i'm excited to hear right your on. story yeah we can definitely talk about all that yeah yeah and your style is so unique. I've never seen... Is deconstruction of pop art, is that just a thing that you've come onto your own? Or is that... Have other artists done anything like that it's before? Like, I, I mean, nothing is original, right? Yeah. But how I got started was... <laughs> artist copy. <laughs> I've been drawing my entire life, as most artists have. And I used to be a freelance illustrator. And a lot of my jobs would entail me taking these like IPs like SpongeBob or Mickey Mouse and like doing them for a company. Mm -hmm. So how this all got started was I was drawing this stuff all the time anyway. And I was also doing all my own stuff for like the music industry I used to work in. And one day I just decided I want to start painting. Cause I just was like, I was kind of burnt out on everything. I turned 30, I opened a store in Pittsburgh and I just didn't want to be a, an illustrator anymore, like on the computer for freelance. Yeah. I didn't like my store. I didn't really know what to do with my life. So I was like, I'll just try painting to see how that goes. And at the time I had this job uh, doing this thing with Mickey Mouse and I had drawn him nice, but then like, you know, when you're sitting bored, you start just drawing stupid stuff. And <laughs> I had like 30 drawings of Mickey Mouse where they start out like how the client wanted to like, then he's getting stabbed, he's getting poisoned, like just like stupid stuff, right? Yeah. And stuff, just, you know how you do with Mickey Mouse? Yeah, like, you just kill Mickey Mouse. <laughs> yeah, just kill Mickey Mouse. So, <laughs> so randomly out of the stack of these drawings, I picked the one where Mickey Mouse head was blowing up, like mm -hmm. randomly. And I painted that in my basement. And then I was like, well, this was kind of cool. Like I liked how I got my hands dirty for the first time. Cause on the computer, you just like, you, you just like, you don't make anything. It's nothing tangible, right? Yeah. So I'm gonna make some more paintings. So I was like, well, I already have one of this guy's head blowing up. I'm gonna make more like this. So I made, I did like a series of 10. I just like picked random things and blew their heads up. And then uh, I had a show at a bar in Pittsburgh actually. And it got such a good reception. And it was like, I got, it's like, I feel like a lot of energy, like, up until that point, even though I was working for myself, being an illustrator, I wasn't really like feeling what I was doing. Yeah. But this was the first time that uh, I was just really excited and like excited to wake up and make this stuff, right? Hmm. So that's how it kind of all got started. And it wasn't until I moved out here to California, I had a show at a store called Ron Robinson, which is like near Santa Monica. And he's the one, he actually says, so what, what do you call what you do? Do you call it like deconstructive pop art? And I'm like... Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You're like, that's it right that's there. What I call it. <laughs> that's what it so, is. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's where the name came from. It came from him. 
but I stole it from him immediately and been calling myself that ever since. Mm-hmm. And this was a gallery or who, who this was, was this? a store. So when you're starting out as an artist, it's super hard for anyone to believe in you to put your work in their place because like stores, galleries, they only have so much real estate. They got to pay their bills. Like if you're not the kind of artist that shows up, it's not going to produce the work or no one's going to buy it. Yeah. It's a super huge risk for them. Mm-hmm. So as an artist, it's easier to get started showing in bars where they already have a guaranteed audience. They don't need you there. You know, and after that, I started doing like stores. I did a, a skate shop store here in LA, and then I, through that, I met somebody, and I did. Ron Robinson's more of like a high end boutique. Yeah. So again, they don't need me in there, but why not put some art in the wall? So this yeah. is where that show was, and then eventually I started going into galleries. Awesome. I love. Yeah. That. You talked about your first show being in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Were you born and raised there? Yeah, I grew up there. Awesome. I I lived there until I was maybe thirty two. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I spent my entire life there, and we moved here when I, yeah, then I've been here for six years. So, can you talk to us a little bit about your upbringing and your inspirations growing up? I mean, what was your childhood like? Yeah. What did you look up to? You know, it's so funny being in Los Angeles because there's so many artists here, and there's so many people from all different walks of life, like people that were born rich and just doing art to pass the time. Mm -hmm. You know, people that... Like 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 Kim here, I don't know you, but I feel like you're more in the fashion industry and your artwork reflects that and it's beautiful. It's a completely different thing than what I would do. But what, mm-hmm. my point is where I grew up, like it was very blue collar. There wasn't a lot of like culture coming in all the time. I grew up in like the middle of Pennsylvania. So there wasn't anything, right? And when I moved to Pittsburgh, even though it was a bigger city or just a city, there still wasn't a ton of artwork there. There wasn't anyone coming into town doing exhibits that I personally liked, you know? Yeah. So my upbringing was just really just comic books and cartoons and video games. It's like stuff like boys like when they grow up, you know? And some people grow up and like they get interested in business or law or being a doctor or a fashionist. I just always did what I did. Like I always have been drawing my entire life and just kind of carried over from that. So I really don't know what else I would be doing with my life if I didn't do what I do now. I yeah. love how a lot of artists say that too. And I was yeah. like, that's how you know you're doing something right. If you get excited every morning, like that moment when you were saying, you're like, this is exciting. I like this. I want to keep doing this. Mm-hmm. I also love how you're saying the inspirations that you got because it was from comic books. And I see how well that has translated into the fine art world. I think it's really cool to see how that seed was planted when you were young and then how that yeah. evolved. Mm-hmm. Then. Mm-hmm. Totally. Um, and with your upbringing too, uh, you ended up going to school out in Pittsburgh, right? I went to a technical school for web design. Yeah. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that because I was reading that you kind of jumped from job to job while you were kind of coming up in art, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I went to school for web design because I don't know. I just didn't think that drawing was like a, a thing you could do as a, an adult. Because again, small. <laughs> like, it's so funny. I've always, always think this like a couple that grows up in California, Los Angeles, has a baby, that baby says, hey, parents, I want to be an artist. Those parents live here, so they see it's possible and it's a doable profession, like, encourages it. Where where I grew up, no one is an artist, right? So I didn't even think it was feasible to be anything creative, right? So I was like, what can I do? I'll make websites. So I went to mm-hmm. school for that. I made one website after school, and I absolutely hated doing it. So then I started working in car insurance. And I worked in car insurance for, like, five years. And during that time, I was in a bunch of punk bands, and how this all got started was, you know, we would play shows and I would make our band's merch and then the other band's merch. And then, you know, we'd start going to like bigger concerts and meeting those bands and like, hey, I do T-shirts. So I was working in car insurance for like a long time, but on the side doing a ton of band merch. Like, And then there's a store in most malls called Hot Topic where they carry a lot of like, you know, like. <laughs> The band's people that, like, in your 20, you're into, well, right? In, in, yeah, right? You guys probably had some of my shirts at some point in your yes. lives. I think so, because I saw the list of some of the bands you worked there with. There was, like, a million bands I worked with. Al- Asking Alexandria was one of them, yeah, right? Yeah. And then Devil Wears Prada. Yeah. And all that stuff. Yeah. What did you do with Asking Alexandria? Because I was a big fan of them when I was in high school. Dude, I don't know. Like, honestly, man, how <laughs> that all worked, uh, the time that I worked in that industry... What was super hot was like big, gaudy, neon, slime, monster stuff. Uh-huh. And these record labels, it wasn't even like asking Alexander. It'd be like, I can't, even, I can't even think what label they're on right now. Let's just say they're on Roadrunner Records. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Roadrunner Records person, I'm like, hey, Matt, band one, band two, band three are going on tour. We need t-shirt designs. What do they want? I, I don't know, Matt. Shut up. Go make stuff. <laughs> so I would just like He's try like, just to just do something. Yeah. But all those bands at that time, they all wanted the neon gaudy monster stuff. So I would just make things like yeah. here's like a big gorilla 
smashing some buildings. Here's like a slimy devil throwing slime at things. Here's and they just like, ate it up. And everyone's like, all right, we'll take that for that band. We'll take it for that band. And it was tight because like when you're young and you're working with these cool bands and your stuff's in stores, it's awesome. You know, it was a cool way for me to meet girls too. You know, like <laughs> it was cool. I had like an interesting thing about me. But I met a girl and I moved in with her and I got serious and that's no longer, and I started growing up and realizing, oh crap, these guys like pay like nothing for this stuff. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I had I had shirts in like every mall in America and I made like 200 bucks from it, right? Wow. Uh, and sometimes they wouldn't even pay. You know, it's what's that wow. called? It's called a, I can't think of what it's called, but it's uh, like- spec work called a rip spec off work. is what yeah. it is. Yeah, right? So it was like, that's kind of where I hit a wall where like I don't like doing this. And it's and at, at that point, that whole fad of the neon stuff was starting to die out. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying this to say it, but like I, I got started in that thing because that's how I already drew. Like I didn't jump on board. So like that's how I drew. So when it started dying out, it wasn't like I could just switch gears. I'm like, well, well shit. Like yeah, this is right like, now. Yeah. So I, I just got like super like in this depressed thing when I turned 30. I can't remember what the question was anymore. <laughs> but that's. I'm, I'm vibing. Keep I'm going. Going. Yeah, keep going. That's how That's how this all started. That's how like. So. Bouncing jobs to jobs, that's what it was. The car insurance, the freelance illustration. The one that stood out to me, you worked at a calling center for a little bit, right? That's the car insurance, yeah. Okay, and then I read that you worked at a Costco deli center. Yeah, right? I did. Yeah. <laughs> Tell I, us a little bit about that, because the story I read... Like, I freaking hated it. Hilarious. Like, I could six, see how much of a struggle that would be. It was 6 a.m., and I worked in the, the deli. So there's these giant ovens that you cook rotisserie chickens in. So, like, literally, I'd go in this freezer and boxes and boxes these bloody chickens. Oh, God. And in the rotisserie ovens, there's these, these they're, they're like five foot tall spikes, like just long sticks with a, with a point. Mm -hmm. And I would literally have to, like, stand there and, like, drape the spike along my leg so it stands upright and just slam these bloody chickens on these spikes. Oh, my God. Meanwhile, this, this a billion degree oven is heating up. So then I'm, like, halfway in this oven putting these spikes in there and I cook chickens all day. I ate a lot of chicken, yeah. but yeah. then, the end, but then at the end of the day, what was terrible was every day we had to clean those ovens, which meant you kind of had to almost get inside them. But these things, even though they're off, they're so hot. So like you're sweating burning, and burning, like you touch the side and like, shh, like, ah, shit. You know wow. what I mean? It was gnarly. And then I, I, I didn't work there very long. It was really bad. I but it's respect. Like, when I get like a little chicken bake now. Yeah, they're so good though. I love those things. <laughs> the but thing that, I'm glad that you can say that because I feel like a lot of people would go through that experience and say, fuck yeah, that, never, I'm never yeah, eating right. chicken again. Yeah, but no, I'm, I still eat them. They're I mean, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Huh. Well, so you, you were working these, you know, odd jobs or random jobs and you were doing art at the same time, right? Yeah, so, it was. Yeah. So at what point did you have that light bulb moment where you were like, hmm, I can quit the day job. There was never a light bulb moment. It was just like, it's so cliche, the whole sink or swim mentality. Like, I'm going to wait mm. till the perfect moment to quit my job. I uh, I worked at the call center at the time, and I didn't want to be there anymore. And really, I guess what happened was I had so much freelance work in, like, the music world that, like, I would get up in the morning, work on it, go to my real job, the car insurance. On my lunch break, I'd work on my freelance. After work, I'd work on my freelance. And it was just where I was working if I was awake, I was working on what on the freelance or at my job. Mm -hmm. And eventually was like, well, look, I don't want to live like this forever. I'm just going to quit my car insurance job and focus on the freelance. And it was like super terrifying because freelance spec work, nothing's guaranteed, right? Yeah. But the car insurance job, even though it was boring, it was guaranteed money. Mm -hmm. But it was like, I can't do this. I'd much rather be an artist. I'm just going to jump. Mm -hmm. So I guess like the good thing about me is I've taken like a handful of super scary risks in my life mm -hmm. that have always paid off. But I don't think a lot of people do that. Mm -hmm. And that's why people get stagnant and stuck in like the safe thing. High risk, high reward because totally. if you're not, and it, I like, again, it sounds so cliche. What I'm interested to hear is because something that I always try and tell people too is to take risks, but to kind of take calculated risks. Absolutely. Because we've had a lot of friends and it's just the LA <laughs> especially Fog. we got a we got to church here in there and uh we're part of a small group and we've been part of past small groups and there's been some interesting stories where people just leave it up to god with their bills and I'm, we're like i don't know about that well, yeah to trash talk even religion aside just people that that aside they're just like i'm gonna go for it and i'm gonna take this big leap and it's gonna work out and that's not always how it is so i say it's good to take calculated risk but also to take that risk like you were saying so some people all say because we get people asking all the time i really want to do this how do i even 
conceive of just getting started yeah. say well save up because mm-hmm. the the number one thing is finances if you don't have money you can't fucking eat so you want to make sure that you can eat save up every penny if you can so that way when you do either switch to part-time or something like that where you're trying to wing off this job that you don't really like you still have some kind of a pocket of safety Absolutely. but also enough of a push where you're like, I really need to make money doing this yeah. or else. Cause if you don't have that fire under your butt, if you're not really invested in it, then it's not going to work. You totally. Know? Yeah. You're right about the whole dreamers thing in California. Oh, so people, people will just, just think if I quit my job, it will work. Like, no, it's not how it works. That's, how you, know, that's how you end up on Skid Row. Yeah. yeah. If, I, if I move to LA, everything's going to be okay. And it's like, this is where dreams are made and broken, I think. Totally. Yeah. But yeah. I think that's a good thing. The Boulevard of Broken Dreams. Shout out to Green Day. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think it's good for people to hear that, too. Because sometimes people come in with some naivety thinking that it's just going to work out. And it's not. But I think the good thing is a winner mentality will take that smash even if you fail absolutely and just turn that into a learning experience or when you hit rock bottom just be like okay well i can only go up from here like how am i gonna make this going up yeah yeah so tell me about your transition from going from your day job to focusing solely on art because i remember reading quote and you were talking about the struggles of being an artist like not having that 401k and you know the retirement planner and the insurance and stuff um i read a a story that you were in your struggle and you actually uh, you skipped out on what was it like the numbing or something for a tooth oh gosh yeah because yeah. You're, because you're watching your money right yeah i <laughs> i woke up the struggle was good man <laughs> i woke up i woke up one morning and just it felt like my tooth exploded in my mouth like oh. it was if someone had not to be like dark but like i might have killed myself if i couldn't get that fixed because like it was the most painful thing and i like I, it was bad. And anyway, I go the I go to the 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 dentist and they're like, "Yep, that's got to come out right now." And I'm like, "Do it. I don't care. What do you need for?" And he's like, "Whatever." And he's like, "It's like eight hundred dollars to 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 numb." I'm like, "Shit!" Like, I did not know it was that expensive. Holy what? hell! I was like, "What? What? Can you do it without?" He's like, "Yeah, it's just gonna hurt." I'm like, "Do it. Just do it." Well, so was he <laughs> taking out a tooth or what was he doing? So so if it's if it's in the back and they can't pull it out, they break it in your mouth. So oh they, god. They basically <laughs> take pliers and they break it. And like they gave me like a Tylenol or something. They're like that'll help. It's yeah. like putting a band-aid like you sawed your arm off and they're like Yeah, exactly. Help. That'll exactly. help. Oh Have you ever wow. been in so much pain that afterwards you're just sad? Yeah. Like yeah. I was just yeah. sad. I was like I was like why did I do that to me? I was just I I remember and it was what sucked was like he was so nonchalant about the whole thing. So him it's just another day. So he's like talking to to uh, the other dentist like and I'm like meanwhile I'm laying there in absolute agony. Oh god. And then I go home and I'm just like sad. But yeah, he's but, like, hey Barb, how are the kids? You're like screaming in pain. Totally, yeah. Damn. But yeah, the whole like the first year was absolute terror because it's one of those things you'll never know until you do it. Like I did have freelance work coming in. But the safety net of no longer having the job immediately puts this thing in your head where all day long, all you think about is survival mode, mm-hmm. you know? And now, fortunately, I've been I've been doing this for like 13 years now or something where I don't worry about that anymore. I'm doing pretty good. I get to like fill my mind with positive thoughts. But when you're starting out, like you're falling and you're just, how do I grab that branch? How do I climb that branch? Oh my God, I'm going to hit the floor. So what's hard is any relationships you have in your life. You know, I had a girlfriend at the time who became my wife at the, at that time. Uh, you know, you don't really, you can't really have time for anybody else. Cause your mind is just full of survival mode, you know, and yeah. that's pretty tricky. And then just like being too over eager with clients, which is not a good look. Like, you know, like when you're dating someone, you kind of want to play hard to get, You gotta flirt but if you're like, yeah. if you're like, Hey, what's up, Coca-Cola? I love you guys. Oh my God. It'd be so cool to work with you. I'll take any money. I'll do anything. Like it's not a good look, but like when you need money and that's your only source of income, you were like out there like, what's up? What's up? What's up? Knock on every door. And I did that for so long. Mm-hmm. It was hard. It's the hustle though. It's what you have to do. What would you, were there any things that you would tell yourself or how would you motivate yourself to keep going on? Cause at a certain point, a lot of people would quit at that yeah. point. How did you, were you just telling yourself, this is what I meant to do? And I'm yeah, like, it was, through? it was, I'm, I'm very lucky that some people I think go their whole lives and never know what they want to do. Mm-hmm. I've, I remember my mom has this thing I drew when I was like eight that she had to give me this birthday card. It was this little book that 
It was like, my favorite color is this. My best friend is this. Our favorite game is this. But it's like, where do you see yourself in the future? And I literally drew a picture of me and it said, California. I will move to California and be an artist. I've known that my entire life. So like- what age? Forever. That's a drawing? I mean, this book was eight. This eight when I did. But like, I- I, because like I just not to like be weird or anything. I this is all I've ever done. So like it was never like this is gonna fail. I'm like this can't fail because this is all I can do. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know. My dad asked me that as well because it was last last year when we had the whole charity art auction thing. I invested a lot of my personal money into it, and let's just say politely, I was broke. Mm-hmm. Well, like, maybe break down what that was because not well, everyone knows about the art. Uh, auction. It was just I don't a know. Cha- it was a not. It's our nonprofit, so we have a nonprofit as well. And this was our first time ever having an event like that. We just said we're gonna do it. We didn't know how the fuck to do it, and we did it. We pulled it off. It was great, but it just hit me hard financially. Gotcha. And this was me. I was working for myself as well as an artist. And so that year was rough. And my dad, he's an engineer. And so even uh, he's now that I'm making money, of course, he's warming up to the idea of me being an artist. But before yeah. then, and it, it's just because he cares about me. But he would say, when are you going to throw in the towel? Like, yeah. when are you done? And I, without a shadow of a doubt, I just knew I'm not. You know, like this, this is what I meant to be doing. This is Mm -hmm. what I want to do. And I think to have that mentality in the times when things get really dark, that just keeps you going. And even if you just tell yourself that, because I think there's a lot of power, even if you doubt it, write it down, tell yourself, it'll keep you going. You're like, I meant to do this. This is going to work out. I'm going to make it work out. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's really cool um, theme that we hear in a lot of creative people that are successful. They're yeah. like, I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to make yeah. it work, you know? And where does the money go towards with your charity? Because I'm sure Matt would love to know about that oh, as well as well, the other listeners. Oh, well, Marisol 2020 in November is coming up soon. Um, the kid... <laughs> plug in the website there you go <laughs> um it goes to kids in tijuana mexico so disadvantaged youth um so uh orphanages we work with a couple orphanages and after school care programs because little blurb if we invest in the children that helps make for a brighter future in mexico and in other places as well but that's just a spot that i've always had a soft spot for and there's a lot it's so close and there's a lot of need and a lot of people don't know about it so yeah there's there's that little thing on that fair enough but yeah cool. so anyway say wayne back to you so getting back into this transitional period for you from going from the day job to pursuing art full time uh what was may you say like the growth strategies that you used when it comes to maybe like local marketing uh online maybe at the time what were you doing to yeah. try to pursue growth in uh, your career there's two different points in my career two different parts of my career the first smaller part was the the, the merchandising like the freelance illustration and when i did that i primarily worked in the music industry so i was in bands so it was kind of easy for me because i was already in that world you know like i already read the music magazines and like went on the website so what I did at that point, because in my mind, my way to make money was to make band merch was I would go on the band or like the music websites like Spin or Alternative Press, uh, buy those magazines or whatever, go on like at the time MySpace and every single band they mentioned in that magazine, every single one, the ads, the the reviews of the new albums, everything. I'd find them online. I'd try to find their management company and I would email Yes. And I would That's email smart. everybody. And... I would be like, my name is Matt Gondek. I make band merch. My band merch is really popular in these stores where I see your band is trying to get to or is already in there. Like I show them examples. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it it worked. But I really was beating down doors like crazy. And uh, when I I got sick of doing the whole merchandising thing and I became like a fine artist, I did the exact same strategy where uh, it was a combination of like social media stuff, which we can get into later if you want. But as far as, uh, you know, trying to grow as an artist, like I, I realize what's like the law of averages of numbers, right? Like I must have DMs and emailed 300 galleries before I had my first show in Detroit and not to, it was a very small gallery that's not around anymore, but they were amazing. And like, they, they took me out there, had a show and Hmm. I was just out there like, yo, what's up? What's up? What's up? Who are you? You know, like I, I moved to California. I went out the door talking to everybody I could, like beating everyone over the head. And on top of that, if I wasn't doing that, I was creating stuff. Like, mm-hmm. like I, I said this earlier that I really do genuinely enjoy what I'm doing. I, I didn't pick something and do that for money. So like that does help because like it, it's not a burden for me to work hard because I'm genuinely 
I'll wake up, I'll have this idea of something I personally would love to have or make and I'll go do it, mm -hmm. you know? But I mean, it's like literally just like beating people over the head, like, hey, mm -hmm. gallery, hey, other gallery, hey. My first couple things in LA, uh, uh, a skate shop, I did, uh, this, there's, a, there's a printing company in Las Vegas that has like an event once a month where they have a band and a food truck and an artist. I did that, you know, I went there and painted a mural. Mm -hmm. Like all this, you're just random. doing everything. Yeah, you have to at first. You have to be so everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. And then eventually, you want to pull back. And like we started the conversation about how the line out the door at my show and people line to get everything. You eventually have to pull back and make yourself harder to get because mm -hmm. that, that drives people crazy. It's a different strategy, though. Totally. But when you're in demand. But in the beginning, you got to just like get out there. Like I was putting up stickers everywhere all the time. Like I had. I put up thousands and thousands of these stickers where when I got popular in the beginning, one of the first things I did was in this magazine complex. It was like this Homer Simpson blowing up. Which by the way, I love complex. So that's really cool to see that you were covered by them. Yeah, yeah. this was like a, a big deal when it happened. So I took that image and I put my Instagram on it. It's a blue sticker with the yellow Homer. It says my Instagram. And then everywhere I went all the time putting up stickers and I've sold paintings and made relationships through those stickers people found I, uh, me you know like just going insane with marketing yeah. all the time yeah. you're right i think later on in your career you know it's very important to let the gallery find you you know and my whole thing is like when you said you went off the social media thing is like i really am conscious of my social media and i do try to develop and nurture it mm -hmm. but at the same time, my fear would always be I'm spending 40 hours a week pumping my attention into like say Instagram or, you know, some other app instead of me making my work better. And then two years from now, that app's gone. Where yep. if I have great work, it doesn't matter what app is out. It doesn't matter. It's always mm -hmm. going to be there. Like, you know, so to me, that's important. I think both sides are important. There's a balance to it, right? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that I was going to ask because we like, okay, we jumped ahead to the gallery stuff. I wanted to take a step back and ask you about um, social media because one thing that's really cool about you is you work with wonderful galleries, but also you have a social media presence, which yeah. I think is important. What came first for you? Did you grow yourself up on social media? Um, and then start working with bigger galleries or did you try and work your way up the traditional gallery route and then start gaining a following on social media? It was really just um, at the same time. That's cool. Yeah, uh, I remember, for, like for right now I have what, like 152 or something on Instagram mm -hmm. and that's the only one I really mess with like i have a facebook but it's just like whatever but yeah, i think space, a lot of people but, are whatever about facebook right? yeah instagram has a great return on investment totally though, which is yeah wonderful. but i think i've been working with the same gallery uh for like the last three years and i had 40k at that point hmm. and i remember knowing that you know in this world not to say that the gallery i work with but everyone on earth a little bit superficial nowadays where like Kim, I don't know you, but you know, if you message me and I click on you and you have a blue check mark and 300,000 followers, I'm probably gonna stop and like give you a little bit more attention than you having like five followers. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate. Instagram changed, you know how DMs, they'll send you DMs and now they organize it by who is the most I know. Now, I was like play into that, why don't you? I know, right? And then stand you out delete now, the right? likes, they're like, we're trying to promote creativity. I think they're trying to control the market, but that's neither here nor yeah, there. Yeah, so. totally. <laughs> so that, that all being said, it is important to worry about that stuff, you know? And, yeah. I, I I consciously always um, worried about that. And obviously once I started doing bigger shows and traveling, I got more followers only because I was reaching more markets and I was more interesting to, to people, you know? So, and then, on, then when I started doing sculpture work as well and making toys, it attracted a whole other demographic of people that aren't into paintings, but they're into mm -hmm. toy collecting or, or sculpture. So yeah. I got those followers, you know? So I guess to, to go off what you're saying is like, you kind of have to diversify what you're doing a little bit. You know, if you are an artist and you're really good at making concrete tables, that's amazing. But there's only a finite number of people on earth that care about that. So yeah. maybe you can put concrete on something else and you're going to attract this whole other demographic. You yeah, know? diversify it. I yeah. think that's cool. And I like what you said too about the platforms as well. And that's something I say because Instagram can go down tomorrow. Totally. And also, so this is something that we explore a little bit and I talked so much shit on it at first because it's so cringy. 
but TikTok. Oh my god. Yep. So we're what going do you think there. Of that, by the way, before I, I tell you, what do you think about it? <laughs> I just got one like two weeks ago. Yeah. I feel like an old man with like a rock in my hand. I don't know what it is. Like it's so weird. I open it up and it's like just like fifteen year old kids dancing, and then like yeah. two million views. I'm like shit. Like yeah. here's a painting I did, <laughs> and no one cares. Yeah. And I, that for- I've seen you do time lapses on YouTube though. Are yeah. you? Do, are you doing more of those? Or no. Do you not like to do those as much. I'll be. I'll be completely transparent. Those time lapses are maybe four or five years ago when I did my entire painting in two days by myself. Mm-hmm. Mm. Nowadays, my paintings take like a month and I have a team that helps because like my new paintings, my, my show Control, we did these these like eight foot comic book panels. So there's like a lot going on. Yeah. And it would take me three months to do it myself, you know? And like, could you imagine me trying to record a video every day for three months mm-hmm. and, and then on top of doing everything else? Like, yeah. So that's why I stopped uh, doing it. Every once in a great while, I'll go like on Instagram Live and just paint for a while. But like, that's, cool. that's all I can really afford at this mm-hmm. point. But I do realize mm-hmm. I have a manager as well and he's like, TikTok, TikTok, TikTok. I'm like, ah, I don't yeah. want to. So I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but honestly, mm-hmm. so... Is that- Sorry, that was me. Um, <laughs> uh, so I was kind of on that. We had a meeting um, with the team and we're saying, okay, so the thing is platforms are ever changing. Instagram can go down in a day. It's really good to diversify. So get things like email lists, uh, get on YouTube, get on different platforms in case one goes down so you're not weighing too heavily on one. Because to be totally honest, I get most to all of my sales from Instagram, which is very interesting. Um, but part of that is just finding, okay, what's the next big app going Mm -hmm. to be? And so we were talking about Twitch versus TikTok. We said, okay, TikTok seems to be more fitting for the kind of content that we're creating. So let's go on TikTok. Mm. So I create videos for my Instagram stories anyway, just of, I'll put the tripod up and put my little pop socket on and then just record. To Mm. document. To document some of the art process of what I'm doing. And it's fun. Usually there's music on, there's wine. It's, it's a fun time. Yeah. And so, and I have one of my interns Jay, she's very sassy and she has wonderful captions. So I said, okay, here's the basic instructions with TikToks. Here's the hashtags that you should be using. Have fun with the captions and let's see what happens. Mm-hmm. Um, let's post three times a week. Let's see how that goes. Yeah. And so she was posting, we were getting traction, which was interesting because I remember a long time ago when TikTok first became a thing and I tried posting, it got like two views. It wasn't even worth it. Yeah. So we created a new page. This was, I want to say like five months ago, probably. And they were getting a good amount of views. So first it was like 5,000, then it was 10,000. Jay posted a video and it was just of me. I was actually painting this gold piece and I was just singing to Ariana Grande's song. And uh, and it was like, she had a sassy caption saying where my diva's at because I was painting with gold. Yeah. And immediately, uh, I want to say a couple minutes, I said, Jay, this is at 15,000 views. That's really good. Yeah. And then she texted me. It was like 10 minutes. She's like, dude, it's at 50,000 views now. It's it's going up a lot. Yeah. Overnight, it got a million views. That's amazing. And then the the traction that we got on Instagram, because now we have people that will message my manager and say, hey, I found you on Instagram. What are your prices? We had people from TikTok saying, hey, I found your art on TikTok what are your prices? Really? And yes, and this is in four months. So I think where TikTok is right now, kind of like, you know how people became famous on Vine and just started growing up a lot? Yeah. Um, Because they caught it at the right time. So now Instagram trying to grow on it, it's incredibly difficult because it's a saturated platform. Totally. Right now, TikTok has kids that are dancing and singing and like dumb content. Yeah. So they're starved for good content and I think they're really trying to promote it. And it's not even like good content. It's just like, it's ditzing around, you know, yeah. but but you're making something. We're making something. Yeah. It's better than, in my opinion, someone just like lip syncing yeah. to like a thing that 500 other people are lip syncing to, you know, totally. and it's original content and it's art, which I think is something that adds value. And so, yeah, that video is at uh, almost 2 million views. Now we have another video that got a million views. And we're at like 50,000 followers now on TikTok. That's amazing. It which is c- considering the time and effort spent on yeah. it versus Instagram. So this is why I'm telling all of my artist friends. Like I told Felix, so one of our friends we interviewed, he's at like 
uh, I want to say almost a million on Instagram. He has very beautiful, mesmerizing content. And I text him. I said, dude, uh, you need to get on TikTok. Yeah. I was like, your content will blow up on there. And then a couple weeks later, because him and his wife work as like a team together, she posted a YouTube video like, here's all about TikTok. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yay. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. You see me that link? She's like, I, here's how to, yeah, I will show yeah. you. And his stuff's really cool okay. too. They're mm-hmm. a really, really cool couple. But the main pull away from that, we got to see some documentation on TikTok, bro. Yeah, yeah. We're hungry <laughs> Honestly, for it. yeah, you're, <laughs> For. Uh, as as honestly like just just have fun especially if you're doing art i think art's something that it's a cool fun you're gonna do it anyway so yeah. just document some of it totally. and have fun with it but so, yeah on your methods of creating you talked about your team yeah um and you use um vinyl right to create your sculptures the the toys are made out of vinyl yeah. yeah yeah so can you talk a little bit about like your creation i saw in a video that i think you create your own pigments too right for paintings, yeah. Yeah, so, so you know, walk me through, I mean, maybe some of the ingredients or things that you use in your pieces. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, for the paintings, they're all acrylic. Yeah. Uh, when I got started back in the day, I didn't know any better. I just used house paint, like, from Home Depot. Mm-hmm. But now I use a... I brand. still do sometimes. <laughs> I mean, they have great colors. Bear, Bear has really good colors. I, I always encourage people starting out, go buy Bear paints. cheap. Yeah. It covers great. But now I use this Southern California brand. I don't want to say out loud because I'm keeping that a secret. Yeah. Oh, good trade secrets. We yeah. Get it. No, but we say that too. Sometimes we're like, this is non-disclosure. Totally, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. But like, the, so the vinyl toys, like, I guess from the outside, you wouldn't know this, but like, none of us make our own toys. Mm-hmm. Like, at all, to produce a vinyl toy in America is actually illegal. There's something in vinyl that's like some chemical that oh God. <laughs> it's illegal in America to produce something with it. So all this stuff is getting made overseas in China, places like that. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, uh, when you get started out, most of the time a company will just make one for you and you just kind of send them drawings of like all the different perspectives and they'll make it over there. But uh, interesting. Yeah. And then like you can make, but like you can make fiberglass. Like I made a 10 foot tall fiberglass statue last year and you can make those in America because it's fiberglass. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've been working with bronze. I have a new bronze figure coming out soon and that's just a company here in uh, Los Angeles. But as far as me and my own personal hands, I just paint. I don't physically make things in bronze, vinyl, anything like that. And it kind of goes back to the whole thing. Like, I don't know if we'd said this while recording before, but you can only do so much yourself, you know, like yeah. play to your strengths, like hire other people that are good with things, you know, like yeah. go like, and it's so funny because like, I guess I was also a little, uh, what's the word, like guilty of this when I got started out. Like you look at these bigger artists and you're like, Oh, he doesn't even do his own work. You know, she 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 didn't do that. She just stands around all day. You know, like mm-hmm. no, there's a reason they they got to their point. You know, they know how to delegate and they know how to come up with a good idea and they also know how to execute it correctly and hire mm-hmm. other people, which is a huge skill as you grow as an artist. Mm-hmm. Only you know? so many hours in a day. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. With that being said, too, I think of Shepard Ferry as an example because he scaled his brand to such a large size that sometimes I'm, I'm like, oh, he probably didn't do that mural or maybe he had no, a little bit did. of influence in it. No, I the know. We've the seen street. that recently. Huh? He came for the, the photo the shoot. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. like, that's exactly who I think of with that. I mean, he scaled and built his own team and used his own brand image, but he's touched every step of the way totally. in order yeah. to be able to delegate that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, which I think is really cool. And sorry, because I know we stepped into our theory, but I wanted to like take it back again really quick just because I think these are important questions. Sure. But what do you think has a bigger return on investment? And even if you don't know, um, the social media, because you have a good size social following or they're working with galleries. What do you think sells more? Uh, that's 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 a good question. I know that whenever I was doing anything myself, no gallery, just building a social media presence, mm-hmm. I could very easily sell prints and sell paintings without the gallery. Yeah. But I was selling them for like a thousand dollars. I think I think. Uh, something that younger artists don't realize is the benefit of working with a respectful, prestigious adult gallery is it adds this value to your work that you can't get yourself, Mm -hmm. you know, like especially, and also on top of that, uh, uh, the right person, the right gallery can kind of coach and teach you how to be a professional. Like I was just making work and it wasn't, it was kind of sloppy, you know, or whatever. And my gallery, you know, I, I don't have a lot of people in my life telling me no. And he was the one who came up to me. He's like, what do you want to be? Like, what kind of artist? He's like, you want to be like this really professional thing. Like, but but you're telling me this painting's done. And I 
the, the lines are, are wrong. You know, mm-hmm. like, I, there's 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 <laughs> paint splatters. Like, the, which is bold to tell an artist. <laughs> but 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 he knew. He asked me before he said that what I was going for. I'm like, I'm going for clean, perfect things. He's like, ah, is that okay. clean and perfect? He's like, he's like, so that's something that a gallery can kind. And also like, you know, not every answer he gives is something I want to hear. Yeah. But like, I'll run ideas by him. Like, don't do that. You know, that's that's not a good idea for you to do right now because like you might be shooting yourself in the foot. That might be a step backwards for you. You know. Yeah. Uh, it's it's hard for an artist to find a relationship with a gallery that is mutually beneficial because I think especially like a problem I've seen. I have a friend and she always makes fun of me because I always bring this up. Like mm-hmm. she got popular really quickly, covers of like art magazines and every gallery was being done her door to her show. Mm-hmm. But she'd do a show, they'd take the work, they'd sell it and they'd fuck off. You know, they don't care about her. They're not mm-hmm. developing any sort of relationship with her. They're not helping her. They, they just, just wanted to cash. Yeah. Oh, you know, so, on what's hot kind of so thing. that's yeah. what, that's the problem of the whole social media versus gallery thing. There's so many different ways it's played on both sides and, mm-hmm. You kind of have to do both, you know? Yeah. And you have to be smart about it. Because, like, yeah. yeah, social media obviously is amazing. Like, my show had the line out the door because of my social media and my marketing. But I'll have a show again, and they'll buy more because my work's good. Because mm-hmm. I did that. You know what I mean? So it's you have to do both. Yeah, I think that's really smart, too, how yeah. you put it. Because I think having a little bit in both. And I like how you said, because I think a lot of younger artists do realize that, or don't realize that, um, galleries do add value. They add um, years and years of their expertise and things that they've studied with art dealers, relationships that they've built, and they're bringing that to you. And like, because even for me at first, because I work with one gallery right now, um, and for me, I think I'd been spoiled on social media. You don't give up a commission. I give a small percentage to my manager, and that's it. Mm-hmm. And then when the gallery showed me the numbers, I was taken aback. I said, no (laughs) and (laughs) granted not i think every every case is different i knew the value of my name and what i was bringing to the table and so i was in a spot where i could negotiate but i said respectfully like i really respect you i respect what you're doing i understand that i'm new to this world but also i know my worth and i think that's one thing that artists even if you're faking it you have to know your worth because then people will just walk all over you totally um but for you so you said that you would reach out to a bunch of different galleries and then eventually you had a couple that um would say yes Yes. what was the evolution was it starting off in group shows and then what were the steps in between that took you to where you are today, where you have this wonderful relationship with a gallery yeah, sold out show, just like people lining up out through the door, like the epitome of what I would say is success as an artist. Yeah. So what were the stepping stones to get you there? Okay. It's funny that now that I'm sitting here, I can tell people and give advice, Yeah, but I didn't know any of this stuff until I did it. And I got lucky yeah. and a lot. And I'll tell you when I got started, you know, I had the shows in bars and, and I would just, and at the time when I was doing bar shows, I was making money from the freelance illustration. So my goal was to just have my work sold. So mm-hmm. if someone asked me about my show, I could say, yeah, it's sold out. So I was selling the paintings for a hundred dollars at the time, mm-hmm. which at a bar. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know what I, I didn't know how to make a painting time. The point I was just trying to do was I'm making paintings. They are selling. No one else needs to know for how much, you know? Yeah. So inquire only. Yeah. Price. Right. Yeah. So then I moved to California <laughs> and I had a show, you know, at a, at a, the skate shop and the paints were $400, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, the point I'm getting at, you know, going, 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 I was doing group shows like all over the world at this point, but the, the, those guys were like, how much should we sell your work from? Like, I don't know. A lot of artists, <laughs> younger artists don't know how to price their work. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, the gallery I work with now, Avenue D arts, I got really lucky because they kind of found me early on. Like I was selling paintings at the time by myself online for like a thousand dollars and they found me and, they really helped me in the beginning to learn how to price my work. You know, like when I found them, I sell them for a thousand. They're like, well, they have to be more than that. And like, here's, yeah. here's the reasons why. So I, I don't really, I don't really know. Like I caught lucky, you know, I, they found me early, but uh, going to what you said about your name and having, adding leverage uh, this year, so I've been working exclusively with the Avenue for like three and a half years or something. Mm-hmm. This Which is, is the a fir- gallery down the street, down the street here in Los Angeles, 807 yeah. South Los Angeles. This Shout the, out, check this his art the, out. <laughs> this is the first year I'm working with a different gallery as well. Like mm-hmm. I'm doing a, a show in Japan this year at a gallery called Onzai mm-hmm. and the value of the worth where now that I know about my work, how to talk about art, how to handle myself in that world, they came to me and they said, we want to do a show. And I said, okay, what do you want? 
they told me I'm like, okay, you pay me up front, you get me there, yes. I will make it, you know, and we had a con people you're like, all right, you came to me, like Yeah. And it's it's this whole like younger people don't realize that art is still a business. And mm -hmm. some, oh, yeah. and to some people it's not, and that's okay. Some people are like they're doing it for like positivity and mental health, and that's great, but I'm a businessman. I make art as my business. So if I do a show with you, it's a business transaction. It's going to cost you this. I will do this much promotion. I need this to do it, you know? And it's just something that you have to be conscious even when you're starting, but it's hard, you know? Yeah. But it's something that you'll learn. Anyone listening to this isn't going to walk away and know everything that I said. You're going to forget 99% of it. You'll learn this all, but the point is just always be conscious of everything and keep thinking about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Be smart about it too. How, sorry, last question, then we'll move on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow, we got you. So how did you start the relationship with the gallery that you're at now? Because you've been working with them, you said exclusively for like three years. Yeah. Were you working with other galleries and then they approached you? I was you working with other them? galleries. I was just jumping around. Yeah. Group shows, a piece here, a piece there. Mm -hmm. What happened was uh, I was getting really popular in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And I was selling a ton of my work through Instagram in Hong Kong. Hong Kong has money, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They love, and they love Hopefully American pop go. art. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they're obsessed with American culture from what I've heard too. Yeah. It's not, yeah, there's, it's exciting. Just like how people are excited about Asian culture here. It's like something yeah. new. You it's, know, different. Yeah. it's different. It's exotic. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what it <laughs> yeah. is, you know? And anyway, one of these guys who was buying a lot of my paintings went to an art show over there and talked to the owner of the gallery, Dimitri, like, hey, there's this guy in America that, I really like his work. You should have a, have a look, right? So Dimitri Avenue de Arts, my gallery, he messaged me on Instagram like, hey, I'm coming to LA in like three months. Can we have a meeting? Sure. Comes to my studio. I'm like, look, you have a gallery in Hong Kong. I'm selling a lot of work over there, but I have no idea what I'm doing. I need help. He's like, okay. Goes away. A year goes by. <laughs> um, I'm in Detroit on a couch. I just woke up. I painted murals in Detroit. Hey, Matt, I have an opening in Hong Kong for a show in two months. Do you want it? Oh gosh. <laughs> yes. No so, sleep. Woo. And I, I'm like, I didn't even like question it. I'm like, yeah, yeah absolutely. That's what you do. You say yes. Yeah. You say yes. So for well, like, yeah, I've, I've heard one of your quotes is figure it out as you go. Figure it out as you I go. I say that right? too. <laughs> so literally I had one assistant at the time and we just, we made 10 paintings in two months, no sleep. Like, wow. but I was just running off this electricity. Like, oh my God, this is happening. The you drug. know, like, yeah. So it was it was easy to make the paint. It was it was hard, but you get what I'm saying, right? Yeah. And that's how it kind of got started. I went to Hong Kong, and literally, like at this point, that I had the Hong Kong show. I was probably nine years into my art career, and I you always read about like there's a tipping point for people where like you struggle, you struggle, you struggle, then out of nowhere things become far exceed far exceed your expectations. And that Hong Kong show was mine. Where when I got back from that show, I was now this international artist. And things like kind of changed immediately. Like my work was selling, like I had a higher price. I had the freedom to kind of relax and make things I wanted to do, that's you know? Cool. So I don't know if that answers your question, but no, that's my story. No, it definitely did. And also congratulations on all that because that sounds wonderful. Yeah, thanks. Well, we're talking about all the rewards of your career. Uh, you touched briefly on that store that you struggled with, Yeah. right? Uh -huh. So I, I just wanted to get into how do you handle adversity and those struggles? What was going through your head when you opened that shop and it didn't go so well? Uh, how I handle adversity is I like cut it out of my life, <laughs> which is a lot of people don't want to hear that. But like you have to realize when something in your life, like don't give up on things you care about, but the store came from a point in my life where I didn't know what I needed to do next. So I tried some things and the store was one of the things I tried that didn't work. Instead of, instead of being like, well, my pride's at stake to make this work. So I don't embarrass myself for everybody. I'm like, I hate this. It's not working. I need to cut this out so I can try something else, you know? And yeah. so I did. So that's kind of, maybe that answers your question, but the store literally just came from a point where the freelance career was kind of dying out. I didn't want to do it anymore. I was not making any money. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know, I didn't know what else to do with my life. So I was just trying things, which I think is important. You know, if you don't know what you want to do, try mm -hmm. stuff, you know? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> try shit. I think like Gary Vee said that because someone was like, I don't know what my passion is. And he's like, try shit. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> try yeah. shit until something sticks. Yeah. And then you like it. And then yeah. when you get excited about it, do more of it. Totally. Did you ever struggle with self-doubt at all in those periods? Oh, yeah. I mean, all the time. Who doesn't struggle with self-doubt? Kanye supposedly doesn't. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it's because. But I feel like everyone does. Yeah. yeah. I don't, well, to, to, be, to be fair, up until, up until that tipping point I talked about, 
uh, in Hong Kong, like year nine of my career, it was all self-doubt all the time. Is this going to work out long-term? Like, the, oh God, this is all I can do. If it doesn't work, I'm, I'm screwed. And then once that tipping point happened, there was a period of time where my life became, I was so in demand that all I did was work. And then my life became this point of me burning myself out. I had more money than I could ever need. Mm-hmm. And I'm not even saying it's a bragging thing. It's just like, I, when you're young and like you don't have money, you worry about money, right? Yeah. And then when I got them, I was like, well, shit, I'm fucking miserable and I have money. This mm-hmm. is not the answer. I was working all day long. All my relationships in my life were suffering. What year was this when you were in this period? Up until last year. Yeah, it was okay. very recently. Yeah, my, my, that's why my show was called Control last year because the idea of 2018, I'm sorry, 2019 was getting in control of my life again. Mm-hmm. Like I was getting addicted to, to things to stay awake that I didn't want to be that guy. I was making work I wasn't proud of to, to keep afloat. Mm-hmm. And that, that became a whole point in my life. So I kind of stepped back and like, I, how do I be a happy artist, you know, and still have success where I can, uh, feel good about what I'm doing, you know? So 2019 was all about that. And now this year is the first year where I'm kind of going in with like this whole like excitement and kind of like take a deep breath, you know, like Mm -hmm. what I'm doing is working. I don't have to, I don't have to worry about if it's working anymore. Like we saw the show in November control of the line, like it's obviously working. So Mm -hmm. relax, man, just take a fucking breath and be smart about your future and be smart about your health and your mental health, you know. Yeah. Uh last year was rough. I had to cut some very I got divorced last year. Mm-hmm. I had to cut ties with my best friend because some stuff happened, you know, and not not related, two different things. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. it sucks. It was it was really hard. But On the topic of overcoming adversity. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, last year was a point like a, a big change in my life and mm-hmm. it was rough. So it can't help but affect though, especially with something as intimate as art. And your life and what you do, I think it's very connected, you know? I was making everything too, too connected. My, I yeah. just felt like my life was just ball of mess. Yeah. Like everything in my life, I was just constantly pushing back into the ball. Nothing was allowed to come out of it. So I was trying to juggle being successful, being married, this problem I was having with my best friend, my personal health my mental always pushing it back to try to keep it all at bay you're like i'm fine and then (laughs) yeah and then i realized like no some of this stuff if i take out some of this stuff if i take some of this stuff away the ball will be smaller and i can manage it and i can be happy Mm -hmm. and that's what kind of happened last year yeah Yeah. i mean to come to that realization though and then to have a show with an impactful name like control like to have a show about that and I think it's just such a beautiful pivotal point. I'm excited for your future, honestly. Thanks. I feel like you're just on the up and up. Yeah. Thanks. Me I too. Have two more questions. Thanks. Uh, are there any funny or awkward stories that have happened throughout your career that you could just recollect <laughs> in the like, moment? Because I love from that dark spot. Yeah. No, I know. No. You, know you, gotta you, end, you gotta end on an uplifting note. Any funny or awkward stories that you've gone through throughout your career that just like there's just been embarrassing right things. I I don't know, like nothing like hilarious. I I mean, like when you're out painting murals, you're out in the world anywhere. It's so, like dumb things happen. I've oh, had yeah. my feet ran over. I fell down ditches painting, like just dumb shit. Wow. Uh, you know, another thing, like when you start getting popular in something, like I, I always loved the things, the thing, the thing that I am, I've loved in other people my entire life. So when I get to meet these people, sometimes I kind of lost my shit in the beginning. You know, like first year I'm getting to travel, like I mean, these artists that I've idolized forever. And when you're traveling, there's drinks involved. Yeah. So sometimes I'd be meeting these people I vitalize forever drunk. We and talking I've, I've, about uh, that the other day. We're and, like, that's how you know you're making it when yeah. you're like hanging out with these people. Like, hey. I've had yeah. that my career too. And yeah. like, there's a couple of times I've completely, absolutely embarrassed myself. But now that I've been doing it a few years, I'm like, all right, don't do that anymore. The you fun just thing about being an artist is we say, I've said like, we can kind of go crazy and it's fine. I feel like this is one of the only careers yeah. where you can be like, it's whatever. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Even though you're like, God, don't do that. I know, again. behind like, closed it's doors. It's okay, it's okay. Yeah, absolutely right, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's true. Oh, that's that's the, the main embarrassing thing I would say. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then my last one, uh, any advice for anyone that also aspires to be an artist or creative? Yes. Like a young emerging artist. Just do something else. <laughs> <laughs> Go to medical He's like, school. <laughs> Save yourself. Yeah. Stop now. I, I, I see like, I don't know. It's this weird thing going on. Like when I was like, I'm 37 and when I was like in my early twenties, what was super popular was like Tony Hawk and Jackass and everyone started skateboarding cause it was cool. 
And the problem was there were some kids that genuinely did love skateboarding. And all of a sudden, all these other people were doing it because it was cool. And I started to feel like being an artist is starting to become this idolized cool thing to do yeah. where it's not, everyone's not doing it anymore because they love it. They're seeing that these people are painting and, and doing cool things and making a lot of money. So they're doing it disingenuously and they're starting out with no background, no respect, no like no skills and immediately like kind of like faking their social media presence look like they're more than they are. Mm -hmm. So my advice would be like, look, be an artist for the right reasons. Like just because this artist you like is popular doesn't mean that you need to go and emulate their style because yeah. they got popular because they're themselves. And like, even in my own career, like I'm sure if you guys cause is a, is a cause is a very famous artist. And I've been yeah. compared to him because we both paint cleanly. I actually really thought of cause when I saw your stuff. Yeah, I thought I was being have. cheesy because of the whole, you know, sculpture. Yeah. Thing. And it's always been this thing in my life where like, my in my mind, my background was the whole digital illustration. So when I started painting, it was like, I want to make it look digital where it's clean. And like, mm -hmm. that's, you know, the point I'm getting at is like, don't emulate other people because they're going to get mad at you. You're not going to really get anywhere with it. You know, like mm -hmm. just, if you're going to do this, like do it genuinely because, and you'll know really quickly if you are, because as soon as it gets hard, if you're going to give up, like give up, don't do anything else. If you're going to give up, stop. Mm -hmm. yeah because exactly. you're not gonna make it if you so, don't work hard yeah, yeah so make sure that this is your thing this yeah. is the thing well, that you, you really really want to do i think you know it's your thing when you are willing to push through those struggles right absolutely yeah yeah and, and then yeah. shout out your awesome. podcast really quick because that was dope and i found that last night oh clean break a clean podcast break. dealing with art and business we are I on year think. three yeah. Hello. Make sure to subscribe to that and keep up with that. Yeah. Matt, it was a pleasure to have you in, bro. Course, thank yes. you. Yes. Hear your story. Thanks. Yes. That was another episode of Chats with Max. Kim, any closing words? Uh, nope. Check out his art. We're going to plug in the location. Right <laughs> over here. <laughs> we'll catch you next week, all right? Peace.